Michelle Mind Freak was a Githyanki, life cleric of Lacketh, who could never directly harm enemies for fear of retribution. Instead, she got by as a skilled charlatan, lying to her superiors and intimidating her lessers. But that all changed when she was given a gift from who she thought were her sworn enemies. Now, with the ability to rend people apart with only her mind, she embarks on a heinous journey to answer the question. Can a lone wolf beat Baldur's Gate 3 using illithid powers only? But first, the rules. Rule number one, we're only allowed to directly negatively affect enemies using illithid powers. That means we can still positively affect creatures including ourselves and interact with objects and whatnot. Number two, no other party members with their own detached portrait. Temporary companions such as Scratch are fair game, but they can't deal damage either. Number three, no respecking. If we make mistakes with the build, we're just gonna have to live with it. Number four, no barrelmancy. That includes chestmancy to block doorways and other such nonsense too. Number five, no saving in the middle of combat. Every victory is to be earned the hard way. Number six, no karmic dice. This is to make combat a more authentic D&D experience. And finally, number seven, no changing the difficulty at any point. This is a tactician run after all. As a side note, these videos take a ton of time and effort to make, so I'd really appreciate it if you like and subscribe. With that out of the way, time to start our story. Starting with character creation. As stated, we begin as a gith, life cleric of Lacketh, taking guidance, resistance, and thaumaturgy as our cantrips. All three are important for passing skill checks and giving us free ways to gain concentration, which will be very necessary in the near future. And of course, we take sharp Charlatan is our background so we can weasel our way through conversations and get inspiration for it. Our ability scores get looking a little something like this. Focusing on wisdom since our illithid save DCs are the same as our spellcasting DC, while our skill proficiencies look a little bit more like this. We settle on a fitting look, complete with tentacle eye shadow, and give our new monstrous main character a name. Time to wreak havoc, Michelle Mind Freak. We awaken on a crashing nautiloid, with no real powers past our life cleric ones that we already have. All we know is one thing, we need to consume more strength, and also get out of here alive. As we're heading to the helm to take control of the ship, we're beset upon by one of our kin who underwent a similar transformation. She asks us to work together for now, and we head into our first fight. Thankfully, we're able to use our psychic powers to convince her to jump off the ship nice and quick. Unthankfully, that's it for our psionic juice, so we cast protection from evil and good on ourselves and watch as our foes miss attack after attack. Since we can't harm them, we lure them up to a not quite hostile intellect of our and let our cranial pal finish off the fools who chased us this whole way. After that, we manage to get to the helm where a two-team tussle is going on between fiends and what will soon become illithids. There's little we can do to help our future form for now though, so we hustle on over to the control panel and have our first tentacular taste of teleportation to get out of dodge, causing the nautiloid to come crashing down onto a beach, and thanks to our beginning transformation, we manage to land safe and sound. The next morning, we wake up ready to find more tadpoles to consume, as we've already got a hankering for power. During Michelle's exploration, we hear what sounds like foes in the distance and just to be safe, cast sanctuary on ourselves. Sure enough, a moment later, a pack of goblins and wargs show up to fight with the residents of this here druid grove. We do our best to keep the ones not trying to murder us alive, but uh, it doesn't go great for them, at all. But while they're dying, we just use our githyanki mage hand to pop open the gate and start heading inside. The last of our men on the ground go down as we make it to safety, and from here we just spam the horn up top to give our remaining thrall Zevlor a bit of temp HP each turn while he whittles away at all the remaining foes one by one. As he takes down the last goblin, he also tells his people to open the gate so we can all get inside, but I mean, buddy, there's only one of us here and we're already inside. Regardless, watching those folks kill each other gave us enough XP for level 2. With this level up, we take a dip into Rogue to further hone Ms. Mind Freak's dastard instincts and because we really want an extra bonus action once we hit level 3 in this class. We get sneak attack at this level which we can't use and more importantly get a new skill proficiency for which we choose intimidation and expertise in two skills for which we take deception and intimidation so that we can talk our way past most threats. As we enter the grove proper we find tensions are rising crazy high between the druids and tieflings who are inhabiting this place but the druids are nice enough to recognize our authority and allow us to pass and speak to someone who knows more about our unique powers. Instead we find Nettie who doesn't know jack about what's going on but she does does give us some free poison and takes us into her office where we grab our first Mind Flayer Parasite. Not that we can use it yet, but soon our master plan will come together. Our psychic protagonist also gets her first item power up here in the grove from everyone's fave wizard Volo, the Whispering Promise. This little ring makes it so whenever we heal a creature, ourselves included, they get the benefits of Bless for two turns. That's an extra 1d4 bonus to attack rolls and saving throws. While the attack roll bonus doesn't matter too much, the boost to our saving throws is fantastic, especially since we'll be healing constantly, so we'll keep 
keep this one on for quite a while. And to further show off just how quick we're improving after making a single performance check, we gain the ability to play every instrument known to mortal kind. If that ain't psychic powers, I don't know what is. From here, we set off in search of a way to put our powers to use, and along the way we meet Raphael, who seems to be under the misconception that we want our tadpole removed, so we tell him to bugger off and move along, though if he keeps this up we might just have to deal with him later. Further down the road, we encounter a small group of folks with one of them dying on the ground. It's here we learn we can use our powers to exert authority over certain folks in something called the Cult of the Absolute. After their brother dies, we tell him to clear off and use our psychic abilities to absorb another parasite that was lurking inside of him, still with no way to use them. Michelle keeps searching, using our authority to get inside a goblin-infested village and finding the Haste Helm. This noggin protector makes it so at the start of combat we gain momentum for three turns, which grants 1.5 meters of move speed per turn remaining, essentially granting us an extra positioning boost at the start of fights. Nothing too wild, but it's the best we'll get for this act, so we'll wear it for a little while. Continuing on, we head west towards the goblin's main camp and uh, do what we have to do to get inside, which also coincidentally gives us enough experience for level 3 and our second level in Rogue. This grants us cunning actions, which let us dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action. Nothing mind-blowing on paper, but in practice these boost our survivability by an insane amount. On top of that, we gain enhanced leap once per long rest thanks to our racial traits for a nice little extra boost. And right as we're about to step into the goblin camp, we get hit by a brutal headache and hear a commanding voice in our heads telling us about a handsome younger man with a quick easy smile. Oh boy, I can't wait to meet him. Now that this cutscene is triggered, all we need to do is take a nap and when we awake we can finally consume our parasites we've been collecting and unlock some illithid powers. We start off by taking our main source of damage for this run, Concentrated Blast, as well as Psionic Backlash. Concentrated Blast can be used once per turn so long as we're concentrating on a spell and deals guaranteed 3d6 psychic damage to one nearby target at the cost of our concentration. In addition, if our target is concentrating on a spell, we also heal equal to the damage dealt. This ability is why we got concentration cantrips. Psionic Backlash lets us as a reaction when an enemy nearby casts a spell, deal 1d4 psychic damage per spell level that's being casted. This also procs before the spell goes through, so if we can kill an enemy with it, it completely negates their spell. Both powerful pickups that let us deal actual damage. Once inside the goblin camp, we meet Priestess Gut, who gives us a nice little brand to mark us as one of the gang before telling us she wants to have a little chat with us in her private chambers. We head straight there and take a celebratory swig to our new friendship and oh, oh man, I'm feeling kinda woozy. Michelle wakes up imprisoned and in a bit of a bind, but that gets sorted out pretty quick with the help of this stranger who dips immediately after getting gut in the cutscene. The gut scene. After gut gets got, we grab her tadpole and pop that straight into Cull the Weak. This makes it so whenever we bring a creature's hit points below the amount of unlocked illithid powers that we have, they instantly die and everyone nearby takes 1d4 psychic damage. This is maybe the second most important ability we'll ever get as it is so much effective damage on top of turning every enemy into a walking bomb. Then we head back to the Blighted Village where we scare off some goblins for easy XP as well as free the poor gnome they were torturing. Before heading north towards the mountain pass where we encounter some of our kin, and I definitely didn't select the wrong dialogue option and get instantly one-shot, but instead I simply told them that we don't have what they want and they clear off leaving behind even more XP. Afterwards we head just to the east where we sneak up on some gnolls and cast sanctuary on ourselves, causing combat to start and their leader to immediately run up to have a quick telepathic chat with us. Turns out she's been infected too, so we exert our authority over her and she turns on her own pals. She still gets her canine caboose absolutely clobbered though, but that was the goal of Michelle's plot all along. Now we can just grab her parasite no problem, and with the help of our cunning actions and sanctuary, we just zip far away and flee combat. Once back in camp, we unlock Force Tunnel, which is a short range dash that can be used once per short rest and pushes everything in our path away from us. But here's the kicker, there's no saving throw against this. I didn't realize this at first, but it is guaranteed to push, which means if used correctly we can do some crazy stuff, but we'll save that for later. Now that we've got a decent chunk of powers, we head back to the goblin camp and intimidate this guy into hitting us, and then intimidate him well, he's hitting us us, which results in us getting Leviatar's Love, a permanent buff that grants plus 2 to attacks and saving throws well below 30% HP. The attack part is useless, but hey, you never know when a boost to saves will come in handy. Then we head next door to free Volo, cause even Michelle can't resist this wily wizard's wit, and he tells us he'll meet us at camp where he can pick our parasite riddled brain in peace, hopefully not literally. From there, we head to the back of Gut's chambers where we descend into the Underdark via ladder, and atrocious villain or not, we deserve more efficient means of travel than this thing. 
And right next to where we pop out underground, we find a funky fungal town wherein we meet Omeluem, one of our future kin who offers to extract our tadpole. Upon learning it can't be done though, instead he tells us of a potion he can make that should have some effect on it. We get the feeling our parasite is extra sturdy though, so curious as to what this potion will do to us, we set out to gather the ingredients. Our search leads us to a nearby arcane tower, and thanks to the help of a featherfall scroll, we can hop down to the garden at its base easy peasy, where we grab a susser bloom which we can use to disable the tower's security measures. And this grants enough experience for level 4 and our third level in row, getting our subclass for which we choose Thief. A thief gives us resistance to falling damage, and far more importantly, an extra bonus action, every turn for free. That means extra healing, extra dashing, and later on even extra illithid powers, definitely worth the 3 level dip. Once we're inside the tower proper, we grab both the ingredients we were sent here for and hop on back to our tentacled friend. After chugging the foul tasting potion and making a couple relatively easy saving throws, our parasite becomes more powerful than ever before as it turns out the age old adage, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, was indeed correct. This grants us the survival instinct power, once per short rest, which lets us target one creature and if that creature falls to zero hit points in the next three turns they would instead regain 3d4 hit points, kind of a last ditch move but better than nothing. Since we seem to be in the mood for putting our brain through a blender, we have that long way to chat with Volo and it turns out he did mean it literally. Very literally. And uh, there goes one of our eyes. But hey, Volo is smart enough to not get on a future world dominating villain's bad side and nice enough to give us an upgrade, a new eye that lets us see invisible things before scampering off into the horizon. Time to finally clean up that filthy emerald grove we encountered earlier. We meet up with one of the goblin leaders, Minthara, who's struggling to find it and tell her all about where it is. She comes up with the devious idea to have us open the gate since we have their trust and she heads out to go get in position. Only problem is all these leaders have parasites that we want and since there's one left in camp, we might as well take him out. Let's go meet Dror Ragslin. We get into his throne room where he's got quite the audience, but thanks to our ability to play six songs perfectly, we start whistling a hell of a jig that lures everyone around up to the edge of the giant spider pit. Once Michelle's got him where we want him, we flip on turn-based mode and blast a good chunk of them, including Dror, into the pit with a force tunnel. And, well, we picked a fight. The consequences are hardly surprising. Consequences being that we get shoved into the pit at the exact same time the rest of the camp joins the fray. At least Dror is half health. Thankfully, Michelle's got a potion of flying to get us out of our lowest moment, physically speaking. We spend the rest of our turn dashing to get up to the rafters and gain some lightning charges thanks to our temporary boots, the speedy light feet, and put some distance on the troubles below. On their turn, our arachnid allies do some damage to Mr. Ragslin, and he obliterates them on his. Our fighting style begins to take shape here as we use psionic backlash to do a bit of damage whenever we can to any spellcasters. Then, on our turn, we disengage and dash to move as far out of the way as we can and use our action to either concentrate or blast which Michelle really likes, or cast one of our concentration cantrips depending on whether or not we're currently concentrating. Side note real quick, resistance is definitely the better cantrip to cast as it actually boosts any concentration decks we need to make, but I mixed up what it does and use guidance for the most part in these early fights. The enemies mostly miss us or fail to reach us entirely, while Dror and his goons finish off the last spider. The main problem with this build right now is just the fact that it takes two turns to do any real damage, but we are able to keep our health topped up by using concentrated blast on enemies with active spells here healing us equal to the damage we deal. Still, it's extremely slow going and we don't even have guaranteed kills with each blast, and on occasion we've got to top up our hit points with some healing potions. Dror also manages to make it out of the enclosure that he was trapped in, and as his goons are all running out, a million more join the fight. Realizing this fight would take forever if we focus on every little goon, we decide to start using hit and run strats on the big man specifically. And when we get in a really tight bind, we make good use of Sanctuary to buy us a couple turns to reposition and heal up. After what feels like an eternity of Kai and careful positioning and hitting drawer when we can, which isn't always since good old Sea Blast has a short range, we finally manage to take him out and grab his parasite. Only to find out you get an amount of parasites equal to the surviving goblin leaders after raiding the druid grove. Uh... Well, nothing to do for it now that he's dead as a drawer nail. Michelle casts Sanctuary on herself and just walks away, at least asserting herself as the superior villain if nothing else. Using his parasite we unlock Repulsor, which can be used once per short rest and deals 2d6 force damage, and if enemies fail a save they can also get pushed back 6 meters for some more battlefield manipulation and not bad AoE damage. We take a long rest to get our resources back and get ready for, well, choosing the wrong option and getting instantly one shot again. That's a bad habit I've gotta shake. But after that, we can 
cast Sanctuary on ourselves and sound the horn to signal Minthara's goblin horde to initiate the raid. To dig the dagger in deeper, we pop open the gate and see Zevlor's sweet, sweet reaction to our betrayal, but there's not a thing he can do at this point. As we cackle evilly, the tieflings get slaughtered all around us, and much to their chagrin, they can't attach us thanks to Sanctuary, but we can still keep blowing the horn to give all our allies temp HP every single round. And to finish our betrayal, we land the final blow on Zevlor ourselves with psionic backlash, and as soon as he hits the ground, he is as good as forgotten. Zevlor who? Michelle continues our onslaught deeper in the grove alongside Minthara, and we play support in this fight for the most part too. Though we do get the odd concentrated blast in, we're mostly just watching our gal pal wreck shop and throwing healing potions at her to keep her in tip top shape. Once again though, the last laugh and blow go to us. God, that is satisfying. I can see why Michelle makes all these weird noises. And with the front and second lines of defense dealt with, time to deal with the innocents hiding away. Uh just after Repulsor's 5 second delay. Now it's time to finish off the druids, which honestly isn't too hard since if they get too close we can just disengage and run away with an extra dash if we need to. Especially with the help of our explosion inclined friends nearby, and dare I say, a good couple concentrated blast as well. We relay the evil news to Minthara and she is just as stoked about it as we are, and gives us a parasite which we use to unlock psionic overload. Which once per short rest makes her attacks deal 1d4 extra psychic damage for 10 turns at the cost of taking 1d4 psychic at the end of each of our turns. Michelle doesn't deal attack damage though, so this is pretty useless past increasing Call the Week's threshold and getting us further in the ability tree. Our Grove Raiding Comrade also tries to murder us in the night, but after proving ourselves the superior Dami Mommy, we get another Parasite which we use to unlock Stage Fright. This is a pretty good AoE ability that once per short rest gives enemies disadvantage on attack rolls and makes them take 2d6 Psychic on every missed attack for 3 turns, assuming they fail a Wisdom save. Now that Michelle has slaughtered the Grove, we're safe to head off to the Mountain Pass, where we've heard some of her kin are lurking, and along the way we get this cool Rubik's Cube that just appears in our pocket. Once there, we meet Lady Esther, who sells us our next item upgrade, the Periapt of Wound Closure, which maximizes the amount of hit points we heal from any source we heal from. That includes potions, spells, you name it, which is especially nice for the little life cleric in us. After that, we take a scenic gondola ride down to the nearby temple, break inside with a couple wax, and show some Gith goons our cool Rubik's Cube, which apparently their leader is looking for, and they let us inside their crash. We head straight to the lab and find exactly what we were hoping for. Three more parasites and a way to bully the one in our head a little bit more. With a quick chat with the doctor in the lab, she lets us hop inside the Zathisk and begins to torture our mental mate. But we know this routine by now. After a few good saves, our tadpole is only empowered by the process, just as we had hoped. Powerful enough even to destroy the Zathisk. Michelle might look rough right now, but we just gained the ability to use all of our illithid powers as a bonus action instead of an action. Finally, we can deal damage in one turn of combat. The three tadpoles we had picked up earlier get used to unlock Favorable Beginnings, Transfuse Health, and Shield of Thralls. Favorable Beginnings makes it so the first attack or check we make against anything gains a bonus equal to our proficiency. The attack part is useless, but the ability to check part is real nice for conversations and interactions. Transfuse Health is entirely useless since it lets us sacrifice half our remaining health to heal something else for the same amount, but at least it helps call the weak. And it lets us get Shield of Thralls, which once per short rest lets us give something a shield for 10 temp HP, and when that temp HP is lost, the shield explodes, forcing an intelligence save on any baddies nearby, and should they fail, they get stunned. And now it's time to give our new powers a whirl. We pop on our shield and get blasting on a room full of sleeping kobolds. And god, is it nice to be able to deal damage in one turn with resistance and concentrated blast one after another. Thanks to Call the Weak, we're also able to one-shot most of these low health enemies too. What would have taken us maybe four turns before, we're now getting done in one. We do still generally save one bonus action to dash away and keep our distance from the baddies. Once we get surrounded outside, it's the perfect time to hit them with the Repulsor, which also sets off a bunch of Call the Weak and obliterates most of the enemies and leaves the remainder on Death's Door. It's not long after where we finish off the last of them with a Brain Blast. Oh, and one of them burns to death thanks to their buddies. But either way, a phenomenal first showing for our new powers. Anyone foolish enough to oppose us is in for a rough time. To reward ourselves for a slaughtering well done, we head to everyone's favorite Ajak near Jira in the crash to buy the Defender Flail and Vital Conduit Boots. Now, Obviously we can't swing the flail, but it does give us plus one to our AC and reduces all incoming physical damage by one just for holding it, which is phenomenal. And the vital conduit boots give us even more survivability, granting 8 temp HP every time we start concentrating, and since we cast a concentration spell every single turn, we also gain 8 temp HP every turn. There's still some more power to be found across the lake in the Underdark though, so we head there and get ganked by some Dwergar that make the mistake of trying to boss us around, so a fight breaks out. It's a little bit rough since we get surprised and they conjure up a bajillion zombies 
zombies, but once we actually do get a turn, we hit him with the old dash disengage, getting up to some high ground and healing up with a potion. This forces all the baddies to dash to us, and when it's back to Michelle, we start poking them down while using one bonus action to dash away and kite them. The undead fortitude the zombies have is quite annoying, making it take some extra blast to kill them, and on occasion, we do get surrounded and have to disengage. We eventually manage to lure one of the devious Dwergar over to a cliff alongside a bunch of unruly undead and go for a repulsor to get them. Unfortunately, it fails, but Force Tunnel is not so forgiving, and that's one Dwergar done. The others manage to catch up to us eventually and start bullying us with blindness, as well as counterspelling our cantrips, which is just plain rude. To wait out the blindness, we drop a sanctuary on ourselves and get into a better position. Thankfully, one of them makes the mistake of concentrating on Hunter's Mark, so we get a heal off of our brain blast to break our sanctuary, followed up by a stage fright on a good few of them, including the archer, who immediately starts burning away their hit points by shooting at us, right before we get blinded yet again. And on top of that, Get Cole continues to be a nuisance, with upcasted rays of sickness and counterspelling our cantrips, making it so we decide to just wait out the blindness and heal up with another sanctuary. Once we're feeling ready, we break it with another brain blast on one of the Dwergar, only to get hit by a brutal guiding bolt in return. On our next go around though, we manage to heal from blasting the archer and finish them off in one fell swoop. With one damage source out of the way, it's a lot easier to face tank spells, especially when one foe insists on concentrating, making it nice and easy for us to heal up. Only a few turns later and the cleric goes down too, leaving the big man himself as the only threat. So we just kinda stand there and trade blast against each other until eventually he runs out of spell slots and just screams at someone to arrest us while we blast him down bit by bit until he too goes down. And we take care of his reanimated rejects just a moment later. After that showing, I think this might be like an actual decent build. We never really struggled during that fight, even with the surprise round. Now that they're out of the way, we yoink their boat and set sail across the lake, and as soon as we arrive on the other side, we learn tensions are high between the Dwergar and the absolute cult leader stationed here. And arriving here also grants us enough experience for level 5 and level 2 in Cleric. This grants us access to our channel Divinity, which recharges on short rest and can be used for Preserve Life, which is an action that heals us and our allies for 3 life per our character level, not class level, so right now this is 15. We also gain Misty Step once per long rest from our racial traits, which is a very handy little thing to be able to do in tight spots. And to top it off, our proficiency bonus goes up to plus 3 at this level as well for an all-around boost. Continuing on, tensions are indeed high, as we eavesdrop on some Dwergar plotting against their leader, and Michelle starts to form a plot. We convince them we're on their side, and they say if we free Nier, the head honcho from a cave-in, they'll jump him as soon as he gets out. We agree, but first we've got to take out the scrying eye, so we lure it over to the edge and while no one's looking, blast it off with a force tunnel. Problem solved. Looks like there's some chests down where we knocked it though, so we go take a look and- uh, uh oh. Oh no, oh god, they were mimics. And good lord, mimics that hurt a lot. How many crits do these guys need? But we figure out we can cheese them pretty easily by just heading up to the top of this cliff. And whenever we want to damage them, just make the long crawl down to blast them, before disengaging to climb back up and repeat the whole process. All it takes is a small eternity of blasting them down, and long after you know it, they're all dealt with. From their ruined carcasses, we grab the Wondrous Gloves, which are definitely meant for bards, but either way, they still give us an extra plus one to our AC, further increasing our defense. Since we've got a bit more defense, it's time to blow up the cave-in and free Nier. He comes sauntering out and instantly shoves a slave into the lava, and hey, that kind of gives me an idea. But first, some of the Dwergar revolt, thanks to our meddling, and we side with Nier, as our plot to get a reward from him comes to fruition. There's really not much we need to do to win this fight, especially since our new drow friend can mind control enemies, but the problem is, we we want the fight to be somewhat close, so we resort to healing and buffing up the enemies to hopefully make them last longer. They take out a couple of the folks on our side, but it really doesn't last long at all. As a little treat, Nier gives us a parasite which we use to unlock perilous stakes. This can be used once per long rest to make a creature vulnerable to all damage, but they heal 2d8 every time they land an attack for 3 turns, should they fail an int save. A nice little way to gain an extra bit of damage for a few turns. But our secret scheme isn't over yet. You see, Nier himself has a parasite that we want, so we take a page out of his book and repulse him straight into the lava to start up another fight. We get hit by some pretty heavy blows before we even get a turn, so we instantly go into Sanctuary to heal up and reposition as usual. Once ready, we test out Perilous Stakes on Nier, and it works, removing his resistance to psychic damage before we hit him with a blast of our own. And to keep them at a distance, we engage the old Chitin machine thanks to our extra bonus action while mixing in some blasts. In just a couple turns, the scummy slave driver is gone for good, and we get all his sweet, sweet loot. Doesn't take long to take out the rest of all of his goons too, with all of them taking no more more than a few blasts, and thanks to our insane survivability between AC and temp HP, they can't do much to us. After our evil plan is played out and we've had a good maniacal cackle, we unlock our last power for this act, Displace. 
A passive that makes it so any enemy that takes falling damage because of us also takes an extra 1d8 psychic. Not the most impressive, but hey, more damage is more damage. Before we continue on deeper into the forge, we head back to the Myconid colony to resupply and we tell them about our recent exploits, whereupon they give us the most vile nickname. Ugh. As well as Bliss Spores, which grant us an extra 1d6 on pretty much everything until our next long rest. Since we're a bit more prepared to take on what awaits us deeper in, we grab a couple molds to use in the forge, as well as some ore. Then we head down to the forge proper, where we pop in the ingredients, and since I forgot to rest before the Bliss Spores, we use our last spell slot and go in with Sanctuary, Resistance, Mage Hand, and a Hill Giant Elixir active, and we hit the Lava Valve. What comes pouring out isn't just lava though, but also Grim, the Guardian of the Forge, a real tough cookie who just so happens to also be immune to psychic damage. Thankfully, Michelle has no qualms about interacting with objects, so on our first turn, we send our mage hand near the hammer lever and hop our way to the opposite side of the arena, as well as cast jump in case we need it in future rounds. Unfortunately, Grim has it out for our mage hand and meanders over towards it instead of us, and the round after that completely walks over the center and the lava disappears. We spend our turns waiting by casting shield of thralls on ourselves while we fiddle about with our mage hand and finally get Grim into position. The hammer comes crashing down on Grim as we shoot the lever and and a bunch of the only villains more heinous than Michelle come pouring out of the woodworks. Magma methods. But with a good repulsor, we manage to take out all except one of them in one fell swoop. And when the survivor makes the mistake of casting heat metal, we get it with the old psionic backlash called the weak combo. Our next turn, we spend our action spinning the valve to bring the lava back, which Grim does not take too kindly, knocking us prone and dealing a bunch of damage despite all of our bonuses to strength saves. Michelle is a resilient gal though, so on our next turn, we dash and do a couple of hops to get to the other side of the arena, causing Grim to take the bait perfectly and stop in the center. At the same time, the lava disappears again. I could have sworn it used to stick around longer. Regardless, we get him with another hammer crush, dealing another big chunk of damage, and we heal up with a potion. And since the cruel construct waits its turn standing up, we just shoot the valve to bring back the lava on our next turn, as well as use survival instincts on ourselves just in case. The big guy gets us with another stomp as our strength saves are really letting us down, but we do the classic dash and jump to the other side in an attempt to lure Grim to the center. It works perfectly, as all of Michelle's masterful plans do, but as as the hammer falls one more time, Grim lives with a... Uh... 16 HP, which just means we gotta rinse and repeat one more time. Spin the lava valve, get stomped on, Misty step away since our jump spell ran out, lure him straight to the center, and get him with one last hammer fall. Hasta la vista, Grim, and good riddance. Defeating the ruinous robot was not without ample reward though, as we get the adamantine splint and adamantine shield by using the forge. The splint has an AC of 18, reduces all damage we take by 2, makes us immune to crits, and to top it off when a melee attack hits us, the person who did it gets sent reeling for 3 Three turns, reducing their chance to hit by one per turn remaining. The shield similarly gives us immunity to crits, but much more importantly makes it so when a melee attack misses us, the attacker gets sent reeling for two turns, which only makes them more likely to miss again. An insane defensive combo that should help us get through some tough fights to come. Now that we're kitted up, we're back to the surface, where we find some young men arguing with an old woman, and Michelle never one to pass up the chances to slaughter some innocents makes short work out of them. The lady says if we swing by her place, she'll give us a proper reward, so we start heading to Auntie's house. Once there though, we find out she's torturing the sister of those fellas we just took care of, so to drive it in deeper, we tell the girl what we did, and she doesn't seem to take that news too well, oddly enough. Unfortunately, this does piss off the lady who reveals herself to be a hag, and a fight starts as she summons her wee neighbors to get in on the action. The horrendous hag flees to the basement, while we're left dealing with the little lads, which really doesn't take us too long as these guys don't stand much of a chance at all with all of our upgrades. And naturally, we go chasing after Ethel since no one escapes Michelle's wrath, as long as you don't count the fights we ran from at the start of the video, but this goes doubly so for Ethel since she makes the mistake of trying to boss us around. Upon heading deeper in, we find some more of her friends which we promptly blow up. Once we get to the bottom, we use Shield of Thralls and a Scroll of Invisibility so that we can sneak in and free Mayrina to use as leverage. Thanks to our special eye, we can spot Ethel and we use an Arrow of Darkness on the ground to hide in. Since that doesn't break our invisibility, we fire another one elsewhere on the ground right after so we can use the first one as a timer and know when to fire another one. The reason I did this was because at the time, I didn't realize Darkness Arrows always last three turns, counting the turn you fired it, unless you combine two Darkness Arrows, in which case the new one expires at the same time as the first one. This 
This led me to believe it was random, and I waste a whole lot of arrows during this fight because of it, but c'est la vie. Picking up, we use perilous stakes on Ethel, which also doesn't start the fight, and finally kick things off with a concentrated blast. The Swampish spellcaster splits off into a bunch of clones, and we get into the habit of ending our turn inside of a darkness cloud, which kinda just breaks the whole fight, since all of Ethel's spells are ranged and she can't target us while we're inside. It's pretty easy to spot which one is the real one thanks to perilous stakes still being on her, so with a whole bunch of darkness arrows and a near equal amount of concentrated blasts, we slowly but surely start whittling away at her, emphasis on the slowly part. Eventually, we run out of arrows and resort to staving off one more turn with Sanctuary, but something's gotta give. So we head inside her room nearby and shut the door, only to learn that she can't actually get inside her own room, so uh, I guess that's another way to take out this ferocious fey. With a few more blasts, she's reduced to under 30 HP, and when it gets back to her, she surrenders. She offers us a plus one to any ability score in exchange for letting her take Marina, and yeah, I mean, who cares about her? We take the bonus to Wisdom, bumping it up to an 18 and a plus 4 modifier. Now we've just got one last thing to do in this act, time to show our kin what true power looks like. Michelle heads off to meet the leader of the crash, who tries to butter us up, but it's too little, too late. As we're about to show off our cool Rubik's Cube, our very own God Queen shows up, and since we can't usurp her just yet, we decide to play nice for now. She asks us to head inside the astral prism, as she calls it, and go beat up whoever's lurking inside, but when we get inside... My, my god, they're beautiful. I just, I, I can't bring myself to kill them. Look at them, they're my dream girl. Well, now we've got an extra reason to slaughter everyone outside. We prep with the usual resistance shield of Thrall's sanctuary, and our dream visitor also gives us a bless for this fight. After heading back out, the fight kicks off, and since our foes can't do much, we just cast jump on ourselves and get into position. We head to the bridge outside and lure all the enemies there, and cast a scroll of mirror image on ourselves just to be extra safe. Once our killable kin are outside, we hit the Inquisitor with a guaranteed force tunnel off the Edge. Sucks to be him. And we get a repulsor on another dude, leaving only three sad sacks behind. They're decently easy to pick off, especially once we get stage fright on all three of them, and start triggering attacks of opportunity intentionally to make them take damage. And of course, we mix in our usual blasts as well. Our foolish foes get the odd hits in here and there, but thanks to Guidance restoring our temp HP, we're never really worried, and they each go down with just a few blasts. Taking on the whole crash might be a little bit tough though. Thankfully, we find a cool hidden back door. And at the end of the hallway behind this door is a neat looking morning star, ripe for the yoinking. Unfortunately, taking it causes the narrator to say something very concerning. No need to worry though, we run through the convenient portal, down a potion of featherfall, and jump to safety, just in time to watch the fireworks. Ah, uh, it feels good to commit just a wee bit of mass murder at the end of the act. Despite yoinking the morning star, its holy nature seems to reject our wicked spirit, so we won't be able to use it going forward, even though it is extremely powerful. But with everyone that needed to be killed having been killed, and Michelle, mind freak, more powerful than ever before, we head towards the Shadow Curse lands where greater power and greater challenges alike await. Thank you all so much for watching. Here's the stats for this act. Alongside some artwork made by Witchy from our Discord server, I thought it'd be fun to start showing off some of the cool art you'll make each video, and what better way to do it than with a sketch of our previous three lone wolf characters. If you plan on doing this challenge yourself, I would definitely recommend you get the Ring of Protection. I just kind of forgot, but oh well. Thank you again, and a special thanks to our storyteller tier members, Bunny Warren, Player5, Damon, Larry Renzokuken, and the Big Yeet.